Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about H-1B visas uh, for talent acquisition. Uh, my name is Kevin, and uh, I have Evelina with me, and we're going to walk through sort of H-1B registration, what the H-1B visa is, uh, talk about some of the changes to the H-1B program, um, and some of the alternatives to an H-1B. Uh, if at any point you guys have any questions, uh, there's the chat feature. You can uh, you can send your questions to us, and we're going to try to do our best to answer them uh, at the end of our presentation. Uh, we've left some room for questions, so please feel free to, to put those in the chat. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and get started. All right, Evelina. I will be starting with the H-1B overview. Many of you might already have heard of the H-1B visa. It is a pretty popular visa type. Um, it encompasses almost all nationalities, various types of employers, many occupations, um, whereas some of the other visa types are a little bit more specific in one or more of those aspects. Um, however, uh, this visa type is capped at 65,000 65, visas annually, plus an additional 20,000 visas for US uh, higher degree holders, so masters or higher. Um, so this visa is for individuals who are coming to the United States for temporary professional employment. Um, so what do these words mean? So temporary generally means uh, that they will be coming for maximum of six years. So the visa is issued in three-year intervals with one extension at the three-year mark for a total of six years. There are some exceptions to this where it can be extended further, which include recapture of any time that you did not spend in the United States or having an approved I-140 petition, but a green card not being available for you. Um, the other term that I'd like to define is professional. So this is for individuals who at minimum hold a bachelor's degree and a bachelor's degree is at minimum required for entry into the position or equivalent work experience. Um, it's important to note that it's entry into the position that is key here. Um, so an individual beneficiary might have a bachelor's degree, but if it's not the minimum for entry into the position, the position might not qualify. A common example of this is nurses. So you might have a nurse candidate that does have a bachelor's degree, but the position in itself generally requires only an associate's plus license, that position might not qualify. Um, as with everything in immigration and in law in general, there might be some exceptions to this too, but that is just the general rule when it comes to that professional employment um, requirement. Um, when it comes to, I mentioned that it might be its bachelor's degree or relevant work experience, that would equal to three years equals one year of higher education. Um, so bachelor's degree level education. So someone who has 12 years of work experience would qualify, that would be what equals a bachelor's degree in this context. Um, as noted on the slide, employers can recruit and hire foreign workers to perform services in specialty occupations. Um, another term that needs to be defined, um, specialty occupations is that degree requirement plus, um, in USCIS's words, theoretical and practical application of a body of highly specialized knowledge. In layman terms, this would be someone who has a degree that is in some way related to the position and the position duties. Um, so the question here is whether someone without a degree or that required level of experience, whether they would have a hard time performing the job. Um, we would have to show somewhat of a relationship between the degree and the position. These are some of the requirements qualifi and qualifications that are required for the H-1B visa. As mentioned, it is, a it is a visa that requires at least a bachelor's degree or relevant experience. Um, it does not have to be just a U.S. college um, bachelor's degree. It can be a foreign degree, um, but we will have we would have to demonstrate that this degree is equivalent to a U.S. bachelor's degree. Uh, there are different companies that we use that do degree evaluations that can meet this requirement. Um, one thing to note here is there are some colleges in different countries that do do three year bachelor's degree. 
a three-year bachelor's degree generally would not qualify at least unless that individual has additional experience. Um, but as usual, there are some exceptions to this too, depending on what country that degree is from. But generally the rule is that it, a four-year degree is what equals a four-year US bachelor's degree. Um, and we would have to provide a degree evaluation. Um, as mentioned with the experience, it's a three, four, one rule, three years of experience equals one year of bachelor's education. Um, another thing for the qualifications is if this position requires generally an, for entry, uh, a license requirement. So a common example is physicians. Physicians require a medical license. That medical license or whichever license it is for the position has to be obtained and provided at the time of filing the application. Again, there are some exceptions here. USCIS is aware um, that some states do not issue certain license unless someone has a social security number, which means that you do have to have a relevant status in the United States. Um, so for example, in the medical field, again, if someone is applying for a physician license in a state that requires a social security number, um, and they can receive a letter from that state that notes this requirement that the social, sec social security number is required, um, and that could be provided to USAS instead of the license. So USAS is aware that this is in some states would be kind of like a chicken and egg problem um, where one is required before the other and they have ways around this. Um, but in states such as Michigan, where a license would be required at the, um, you can receive the license without having your social security number, that license would have to be provided at the time of filing for the H-1B. We will be talking a little bit on, a little bit later in this presentation about CAP subject employers and the upcoming registration process. Um, I would just like to note that there are entities that can apply at any time for an H-1B visa, and this goes beyond that 65,000 visa number cap. Um, and these entities are called cap exempt. So examples of these are institutions of higher education, nonprofit research organizations, or governmental research organizations, as noted on here. Another common example of an institution that can be cap exempt that we work with, and we can help evaluate if you fall under this, is a nonprofit organization that has affiliations with an institution of higher education. Uh, a common example in the medical field would be a hospital, a teaching hospital that has residency programs um, and affiliations with different colleges and runs those programs. So if you have an affiliation agreement, you might be cap exempt um, and you can apply for the H-1B visa at any time and are not subject to the cap and the registration process that will be upcoming in March. Um, another example, also medical field, is some physicians who completed their residency programs, prior programs in the United States on J-1 status and had to receive a J-1 waiver, they individually might be cap exempt as well and can be hired at any time. Um, there's no annual limit of how many of those physicians can be hired um, as long as they received a waiver through either the Conrad 30 or HHS program. Most other employers, uh, most for profit for-profit employers are cap exempt, I'm sorry, cap subject, and they will have to go through the registration process coming up in March. Um, so the fiscal year 2025 H-1B visa registration, as mentioned, coming up in March, um, we just have some dates that we'd like to provide to you all. March 6th, through March 22nd are the dates that the registration will be occurring. It will start at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time until 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the 22nd. Um, so about two and a half weeks uh, to get those registrations in, which our firm can definitely help uh, you to do that. The government cost per registration has remained at $10 per registration. There were some talks that this would be increased um, and there's a potential that this will be increased in the future, but this year, the government just announced last week that it's it's still remaining at the $10 per registration. Um, selected registrations will be notified by March 31st, 2024, and the earliest that you can file, um, even if you get notified before that March 31st date, is April 1st, 2024. Um, with the earliest petition start date being October 1st, 2024. Um, something important to note is for individuals who are an F1 
status, uh, student status, and their F1 status expires before that October 1st date. Um, as long if you get selected and your employer file an employer files for the H1B before your ex the expiration of the F1 status, those individuals, those F1 students do remain in F1 status until September 30th, so right before that October 1st start date. Um, if at that time they have employment authorization at the time of filing, their employment authorization continues. If they don't, they are still in F1 status, but they are no longer employment authorized during that time period between when their F1 expires and um, the October 1st start date. But it is a way for them to remain in status until they can switch over to that H1B. Um, as in previous years, last year, I think it was one or two, the previous year before that was a couple two, um, subsequent selections may occur throughout the year if not all the numbers are reached. Um, this sometimes happens when um, not everyone apply, some people get registered and get selected, but later their employers do not apply or for, you know, different business reasons or they get denied certain reasons, you know, certain things occur and subsequent selections may occur to reach those cap numbers. So just because you don't get selected the first time, there might be later opportunities um, as well. Yeah, so the USCIS has recently announced some changes to the H-1B process. So some of you who are familiar with the process from years past, um, for the most part, it's going to look the same, but there are a few challenges that we wanted to highlight this year. Uh, so uh, the first major challenge is that, and it's related to one of the questions that we just got, um, is that the USCIS is shifting the process of selection to be unique to the beneficiary and not to, uh, to an individual registration. And what that really means is previously someone who, um, someone could go out and they could get registered by various, you know, multiple different employers um, and try to increase their odds of selection. So you could go out and you can get 15 job offers and have 15 registrations. Um, that's not a good way to do it. And so the USCIS is cracking down on sort of that fraud and shifting it to uh, each uh, beneficiary is sort of a unique registration. So they require a passport uh, that you use, and that's going to be able to uh, make sure that only you only have one shot. Everybody has the exact same odds, regardless of how many registrations were submitted on their behalf. Uh, the online filing for the H-1B, uh, they're going to allow online filing for H-1B visas, uh, which is sort of new. It's going to be launched uh, here February uh, 2024. Historically, we've done paper submissions, but this will open up for online filing uh, as well. So, And then the new thing this year is sort of these collaboration accounts. So previously, if you registered for an H-1B, uh, and you've worked with us, uh, it's been a lot of back and forth. We do something, uh, and then we say, hey, we need you to take a look at this and sign it and go back and forth. But with the new collaborative accounts, um, you'll be able to designate, uh, you know, someone from Miller Johnson uh, to uh, as part of your collaborative account, and we'll be able to get in there and, and work together. So you'll be able, we'll be able to see what each person does. Um, and so it, it should help to streamline the process. If you have an account already, uh, it should automatically change over to a collaborative account. Um, and there'll be some steps uh, that will uh, that they'll walk you through with the people who already have accounts. If you don't have an account, when we register you this year, uh, it will be a collaborative account. Uh, so something new to look forward to um, in the process as well. And the USCIS is codifying uh, a flexible start date. So uh, the fiscal year for USCIS is October 1st. So historically, all H-1Bs have started at least after October 1. Now they're going to codify that you're allowed to have a date that is later than October 1. So um, that's going to be something new. And then the USCIS is codifying its ability to uh, deny or revoke registrations that contain falsities or are otherwise invalid. So another tool in the toolbox uh, for the USCIS to try to cut down on the falsities and fraud that have plagued the program uh, over the past few years. So why should you be interested in the H-1B uh, and its alternatives? Uh, well, oftentimes, it's one of the only options to retain uh, and hire skilled foreign nationals 
um, including those people who may have recently graduated from a uh, U.S. college. So um, those people who may be on F1, uh, have an EAD, may be already working for you in some capacity and they're doing good work and you want to retain them. Oftentimes the H-1B is the only option for them to continue to retain uh, their status in the United States. Um, it's a good retention tool uh, for those who are an F-1 and J-1 student. Uh, they have work authorization that is a limited duration. So uh, depending on if they're in a STEM field, it may be three years. If they're not in a STEM field, it may be one year. This is the next logical step is utilizing that H-1B. You may also have individuals who are working with you who uh, are dependent uh, upon their spouse. Uh, they're in a dependent category and they want to have some sort of independent from their spouse's immigration status. Sometimes it's a little bit challenging if you're depending on your spouse's employer to uh, make sure that their ducks are in a row and that they're filing on your behalf. And so you want to have that independence. And then one of the things that's really important to our foreign nationals is that an H-1B is what they call a dual intent visa, which means that we will allow you to get the H-1B, but at the same time, you could be working towards getting your green card. Uh, not every visa allows for that. And so um, an H-1B being that dual intent visa is really important for those uh, foreign nationals who, who have that ultimate end goal of uh, getting a green card. Some of the alternatives uh, that we often use are the O-1 visa. So the O-1, one of the pros is there's no cap. You don't have to worry about being cap subject or not cap subject. You're only having 65,000 of them. There are unlimited amount of O's, unlimited amount of renewals. The cons are that it has a higher standard. So the standard for an O is someone needs to be uh, a person who is of extraordinary ability, someone who has won, you know, uh, national or international awards, someone who has membership in an organization that requires excellence, someone who has been selected to be on a panel to judge the works of others in their field, uh, someone who has publications written about them or has done groundbreaking research, those types of things. Um, it's very subjective. Uh, it's a single intent visa. You also have the L1, which is common, but in order to have the L1, uh, you need to have uh, a U.S. business and a business that does business outside of the United States. Uh, it's limited to five years for an L1B, seven years for an L1A. Um, for an L1B, you need to have someone who is a uh, someone who has specialized knowledge that can't otherwise be obtained by uh, someone in the United States uh, or is very rare. In L1A, you need someone who uh, was a manager abroad at your subsidiary or affiliate, uh, and you're bringing them into a manager or an executive role in the United States. And then the TN visa, which we commonly see here in Michigan uh, a lot, uh, the pros, there's no uh, cap, there's unlimited renewals. Uh, the cons are it's limited to only those people who are citizens of Mexico or Canada. Uh, and there is a limitation on the occupations that uh, the, the TN allows. So there's a, a list of occupations that qualify for TNs. Um, and if you don't fall within one of those occupations on the list, then a TN is not available to you. It's also a single intent visa. So once you file a green card, uh, application, uh, then they will not get to give you another TN because you've announced your intent to permanently immigrate to the United States. All right, so um, that is sort of the, the nuts and bolts of our presentation. And we had a few questions uh, that we want to answer. Um, so someone asked about the uh, likelihood of getting selected in the H-1B lottery if they're subject to the cap. Uh, so we're hoping that uh, the new changes will will increase the odds, but historically it's been about a 25% uh, chance for those who are uh, in the uh, subject to the regular cap, and then the, it increases a little bit to about uh, a third to those people who have the master's degrees or higher historically. We've seen the increased uh, registrations year over year, so uh, we're getting... Uh, over the last year, there were 800 and something thousand uh, applications for those uh, for those H-1B spots. Evelyn, would you like to take the next one? I'm um, sure. 
Um, so the question is, what about elementary and high school teachers in Michigan? Do they need the license first or get a letter from the state that does not license teachers without social security numbers? Um, so my understanding is the same with that as with physicians. Um, Michigan, I think, does require the social security number for teachers. So the state should be able to issue a letter regarding that. Kevin, has that been your experience as well? Yes. Uh, we also had some. So the another question is about the EB2 and EB3 green cards as an alternative. Um, what we're seeing right now uh, with EB2 and EB3 is because of the backlog that is created by the amount of people applying for green cards. Um, right now, there is a backlog on on getting an EB2 or an EB3 green card. Uh, that is something around the uh, 15 month uh, time period. So uh, right now, if you wanted to get someone an EB2 or an EB3 green card from start to finish, uh, before they would actually get their green card, you're looking at more than two years of time. Uh, so it, it certainly is an alternative and in, in other times, uh, it can be a viable source. Uh, but right now, due to the backlogs uh, of timing, what we're seeing, it can take someone two years uh, in order to sort of get a green card. And so not everyone has that amount of time to wait. Uh, so this is, H-1B sort of bridges that gap. Let's get it off. So uh, one of the questions is that we have an F-1 uh, visa. That's, that's uh, someone who's on F-1. They're getting entered into the H-1B lottery this year. Uh, their employment expires prior to October 1st. Are they still authorized to work? Uh, if they get selected in that lottery, so um, then they will get what they call a cap gap uh, extension, which will extend their uh, F1 authorization through that October 1st period of time. So uh, if you get someone that you enter in this lottery and you get notified in March, uh, that they've been selected the end of March, uh, then they will, upon, you know, filing their H-1B, they'll get an extension that will cover them until October 1st. Right. And just to add to that, so since the question also asked about the F-1 employment authorization, um, it depends when their F-1 employment authorization expires. If the application is filed before it expires, then the employment authorization is extended. Um, if it's filed after the expiration date of their current F-1 employment authorization, then that wouldn't be it. If it's during that 60-day grace period that they have um, after the expiration of the F-1, um, their status would be extended, but not the employment authorization. So um, it really is a question of the dates of their expiration. And someone asked if they don't get selected. So if, if they do not get selected, um, are they still authorized to work? They're authorized to work up until uh, that date on their employment authorization document. Uh, if they don't get selected and their expiration date occurs, they are not, they're no longer authorized to work. They have to figure out some other method to whether that's um, an extension if they're eligible for like STEM OPT or some other uh, visa option. Um, someone asked if the grad and undergrad degree applications are separate. Um, I'm assuming this is regarding the registration and the later application. Um, so with the registration, no, it would be one registration that they'd be entered to, but we would enter their degrees um, and they would kind of have just two bites at the apple. They would get the bite at the regular 65,000 and then the 20,000 as well. Yeah. And someone asked, does the labor certification need to be filed before you do the registration? And the answer to that is no, does not necessarily need to be filed. Um, the, so can you clarify about the TN status and employees going through the perm process? Um, are they able to retain TN status while working through the green card process? Uh, the answer to that is yes. So if someone currently has a TN uh, and you start the perm process, uh, they can continue to have the TN. It does, their status doesn't get revoked. But what happens is when you get to a certain period of time, when you're announcing your intent to permanently immigrate, so there's a time period when you're going through the permanent residence process where you're really not filing anything with the government. But once you announce your intent to immigrate by filing an adjustment of status, at that point, 
uh, you're saying, I no longer plan to be a TN non-immigrant and I intend to permanently immigrate. And so they will not grant you extensions when you get to that point of time. A way around that is instead of doing an adjustment of status, um, TN applicants can file with uh, through consular processing um, and still kind of retain their TN while they're going through consular processing. The issue with that right now, um, at least for Canada, um, Canada only had the only consulate that currently is doing these consular processings is Montreal. And it's taking about two years from the stage that you just get to the green card process, um, get the I-140 approved, get your number in line. It's taking an additional two years. So it just it just makes it a longer process. But that is a way around the adjustment of status issue. Um, a question is, would a newly formed nonprofit research center face any obstacles? We're working to stand up our new nonprofit and we have historic links to academia, but necessity our almost two year track record is as a for profit. Um, I think with that we'd have to evaluate a little bit further and see what state of that process you are in. Um, Kevin, would you like yeah. to answer? So I, I would say um, if you are a newly founded uh, nonprofit, if you have a formal affiliation agreement with uh, an institution of higher education, we certainly want to take a look at it. But on its face, sort of just knowing that limited amount, um, you likely would right. qualify as a cap exempt um, employer uh, if you have that formal affiliation agreement. Yeah, affiliation agreement, the IRS letter stating that you're a nonprofit, um, and then an explanation of what the research activities that you are performing, that those are the information that we need to fully evaluate. Uh, the next question was, if I am working to get my grad degree this year, uh, am I still qualified for the additional 20,000 cap? Um, the answer to that is likely no. Um, it depends if you, the, the exception is if you are waiting to have the, if you've completed all of the requirements and you're sort of just waiting to, uh, for your degree to show up, or you're waiting to have the actual, uh, graduation, the registrar can send, uh, a letter to the USCIS that says all of the graduate, uh, classes and requirements are already fulfilled. This person is just waiting, uh, for their graduation date. Um, but if you are actively working towards uh, your master's degree and you have not completed all of the requirements, then you do not qualify for the 20,000 cap. It looks like those are all of our questions. Uh, if you have any additional questions, our contact information is on the screen. Uh, anyone in our immigration group would be happy to answer your questions. Um, and uh, we, with that, we will uh, let you guys have the rest of your day. We appreciate you joining us today.